Hello, Armin again with another video. I've just finished this little project for a contracting company and I thought I'd run through it, uh, mainly for people who mainly maybe just do programming and game dev as a hobby <clears throat> and want to perhaps get into a more professional setting. This is the kind of thing you might be asked to do. So usually when you apply to a role like this, you'll be given occasionally a cognitive exam, just like an IQ test kind of thing. Almost definitely some sort of um, uh, coding quest questionnaire thing, like coding tests, like you'll get on leak quiz. And then occasionally, not always, but you might get a project where it's just like make a small game or small thing. They might give you something to build off or build on if it's kind of a fix these bugs kind of assignment. But yeah, this one's just to get information from online there's a they give you a web url and there's a json data file there and then you just need to present that in this sort of form so these are all the different data you get and you sort them by the grade and you color each brick based on the mastery and then you can also have a mechanical test stack which collapses all the ones that this student has not learned so I guess it's just a kind of a way to help students visualize their understanding of each grade. But yeah, uh, so mainly the main thing I implemented was like camera orbits and stuff like this. And I'll make all this code um, available on GitHub and maybe make an article about it. But I wanted to get into how I go about actually doing a project like this. Uh, so I'm going to go over like maybe four, three points that I find important and the first is planning I think planning is the most important thing pretty much on any solo project obviously if you're in a larger team you'll be having a team leader a project manager that does this for you but yeah it's, it's very important to know what you're doing even when you're doing a small project like this kind of just test demo game thing you need to know what you're doing and how you're going to implement it and how you're going to structure it because otherwise you're going to end up in loops and the more you pro the more you plan the better it is the more likely you are to see problems down the line but even if you just do a very top level thing it's fine like this is a, for a game called uh, a world away which is going to be a remake of my first game so just like a little ship flying around shooting asteroids collecting minerals upgrading and repeating kind of thing and you can see it's just very basic so you have some that some things that are more intricate like add the boost to the ship or create a mineral pickup mechanic and then you have things that are very vague so shop UI you know basic like quest system minerals asteroids and then inside these we have even more layers of abstraction like oh, okay we need them to spawn shards when you blow up and inherit velocity from the shards kind of thing but I'd advise at the very least doing a very high level um, plan this is Jira I'm using, but whatever you're comfortable with. I've used Trello before. I've even used Word documents where I just say, okay, I need to make a ship. I need to make the UI. I need to make a, sto a, a, a story system. And then later on, I'll add to these. I'm like, okay, make the story system involves making the actual class for the story system, recording, writing the story, recording the voice lines, you know, etc. And you build into it like that. But at the very least, you have a very high level plan of where you're going and it's good both in keeping track of what you need to do and keeping yourself on a good schedule you'll say okay at least I've got one thing done today and then if you do that every day eventually you'll finish your project and seeing things move into the done or even just seeing things crossed out or ticked off it does give you some motivation I know a lot of people struggle with never finishing a project like they're always just jumping from one to, to another so you'll do one and then you'll be like oh, okay motivation's kind of running dry and you'll just jump to something else i feel like this is why planning is the most important thing in a project that's what i'd always put above everything else and yeah just because uh, you need to get projects out there and anything you can do to do that is beneficial like even if it's a bad project that's what but my my plan my go-to idea has always been even if i put out something terrible if i've dreamt too big a plan at least i'll put something out because Something is better than nothing. Even if you put a bad project out, you're already a step ahead of people who don't put anything out because they just keep switching projects. Um, and pr uh, the plan is good because you can help uh, decide how you're going to structure your code. You'll see in my scripts folder, I have three different layers. And this is called a layered architecture. 
it's slightly higher level than if you're just going straight into programming you don't really have much care about spaghetti code you just kind of throw everything together but as you're entering a more professional scene you'll need to look into stuff like this so i have the data layer also known as the data access layer or the persistence layer uh, this basically takes the database in this case as i said it's a, J a url which just has a json file and it just this is just a loader so there's not much in this one so that interacts with the data that's online or whatever then you have the business logic layer or the logic layer uh also in, there's another layer in between here i'll describe in a second so this is the basically the meat of it this is goes into everything so this is the where we start our program and it starts a critical load and goes into initialized stacks and then it builds all here i'm not going to get into the code too much i might touch on it a little bit later but yeah this is where the meat of it is and then the presentation layer which is just has the user interface in it so this is quite easy to grasp as well it's basically just how the user uh, interacts with the uh, game and main, mainly showing what's on screen really the interaction should be done by something called the application layer but for my case there is no application layer the application layer is split between the logic and presentation layer so yeah usually there's a layer between the build logic and the presentation where the player is interacting and you kind of handle that and that's where you spend that's where most programming is done but here we've split it between those two so yeah you'll see see here here's the five layers in software architecture which is most commonly used but there's also a three-layered approach which i've gone for um and I've made it more final. Uh, just to touch on like something else, it, this kind of relates to solid principles. The connection is vague, um, but solid principle is another thing you want to add, uh, learn. This is just something you also need to look into if you're entering a professional field. People are going to ask you about solid. They're also going to ask you about agile methodology. Um, so yeah, these are things that you need to read up on and just simply learn. They're not too tough. Uh, it's basically just a way of keeping things separate so each class does its one function and there's a bunch of other ones a lot of them are vaguely the same a lot to do with dependencies and interfaces and stuff but these are more specific to code itself as opposed to the layered architecture which is more general but they both serve the purpose of keeping things separate a way you can further take the layered architecture and separation ideas is by using um, assembly definitions uh, if you don't know what those are you can create them like this, create assembly definitions. And an assembly is just a, co uh, a collection of source code. So usually if I click a file like this, you'll see the file name for the assembly. It'll be something like assembly-csharp.dll. And every single script you make will be in that assembly unless you specify its own assembly like this. Assemblies are good because when you compile code, you compile all the code in that assembly. So if I change this user interface, if I didn't have an assembly, it would compile all the code in my project, which as you get into larger projects can take ages. So here it's quite nice if I change it, nothing else is changing because um, although this depends on other um, assemblies, for example, if I change anything in, if I change the game manager, it'll recompile all this and all the logic code and the presentation code. But if I change the something in the presentation layer, it won't affect anything else. It'll just recompile the presentation layer. So um, this can lead to some issues because it's enforced. If I go into this game manager and I say get component camera controller, this works. Or even data loader, I'd have to I'd have to include it. But it works because. Uh, this file, this assembly has access to the data loader. You know, this, if you look at it, uh, let me undo this. If you look at it, the logic is relying on the assembly, on the um, data assembly, so you can access it. However, since it's not um, using the presentation layer at all, I can't say get component user interface. You'll see, you'll see that nothing, nothing shows up. It just, it can't see it, and. This is good because it re removes sort of circular dependencies. It forces you to do it in one way, but it's bad in the sense that 
And now you have to work have a workaround if you want to, you know, have that relation. So I'll give you an example. If I make a game with a coin collection mechanic, obviously all the coin mechanics are going to be done on the business logic layer. The logic layer handles basically everything. So the player will go pick up a coin and I'll add one to the player's currency. But the, we want to show that. The presentation layer is about showing the player, oh, okay, this is how much currency he's got. But how do we do that? One way is to use something called the observer pattern or events to implement that. And I won't get into it, but what you do is you have the user interface looking at the, um, say, we'll say the money controller. And when the money controller picks up a coin, not only does it add its money, it also says, oh, by the way, I picked up money. And any observer looking at it will say, oh, he's picked up money. Now I can do something in this case, change the value of the money display. So another thing you're going to need to look into if you're entering the uh, professional world is design patterns. Honestly, just learn three or four because they'll just be like, oh, what's your favorite design pattern? And I'll just be like, oh, it's the observer pattern. I like it. I like how the observer pattern works. Um, there's a few ways to implement this, either with like actual observers or you can just do something like like something like this with different observers and each have like subscribe, unsubscribe, notify, or you can use like events, which is similar. And that's it. That's all I wanted to go into. How long have we done? 11 minutes. Not too bad. The last thing I'll talk about is self-commenting code. If you look at my code, you'll notice that there's no comments anywhere. Sometimes you might see XML comments in the form of this, and this basically can auto-generate documentation which is helpful, but you don't actually want any comments in the code itself. Everything should be clear and readable. Like back when I first started programming, I might have called this OMAT just because I'm lazy, but now I'm going to call it outline material because you want to pretend that you're programming for a team, even if you're not in a team, because future you will thank you when you come back to the code two years later and you're like, what the hell does any of this do? What's OMAT? And like, oh, okay, outline material. That makes sense. That's clear for anyone who's going to see it. You know, brick infos, load stack from web, sorted brick infos. You don't need to know what this link query does. You can kind of figure out from the sorted brick infos. And then if you want to read into it, you know, it makes more sense. Same, another example is, for example, <coughs> you're saying example. Another example is my camera component, my camera controller. You'll see in the update loop, I could have just had all this code here. But instead, I was like, I'll take it out, put it in another separate function. Apparently, you shouldn't have local functions in the update loop. I don't know why, but they're only used here. This is only used here, but it's just now it has a name. It looks easier. Anyone who comes into the code layer will be like, okay, yeah, this is changing the orbit and they can see how it's done. So yeah, I hope this helps. I've got a few more videos coming. Um, I've already recorded them, but I wanted to release them in time with some other stuff and yeah, other things I can think of are maybe talking about optimization. Uh, it's hard to think of many examples in the like things like sprite sheets are a good example every every time you use a rent you access a sprite it's another render call so it's good to use sprite sheets you know it's another call to the gpu but if you um use a sprite sheet and just split this up into sprites instead of just having one sprite for each it's a lot more efficient so this is all on one sprite sheet uh, another thing might be uh, object pooling so if you have a gun and you shoot it, once that bullet's been finished firing and hit the wall or whatever, instead of destroying that bullet, do you deactivate it? And when you reload, you um, act, you set it to active again and put it back in the chamber. You always recycle assets because creating assets and sentiating something is expensive. You don't want to be accessing the memory or create or adding stuff to the stack or heap. Well, I always forget. Um, and you can see an example of that here, for example. Uh, in the brick when we test the stack and destroy those glass bricks to make the stack fall you'll see we actually just set it active to active to false so this isn't actually destroying these bricks it's just setting them to false and then when we reset it it sets them to true and replaces them so those are some examples of optimization so hopefully this helps you in any future interviews you might have and yeah uh, not too bad of a video there hopefully it wasn't too tedious and relatively efficient. Thanks for watching and have a great day.